Recently, we published a video called A Tale of Two Systems, in which Tony and I recorded some music, listened to each other's music, and then discussed the process. Since then, we've had several requests for explanations or recreations of the patches involved. That's gonna be tricky. It's been over a year since these patches were originally recorded, and in most cases, the recordings are all that now exist of them. The specifics of their creation have been lost to memory. However, that conversation that we caught on film does yield some information about certain techniques that were used in their creation. This has led me to wonder about what it means to recreate a piece of electronic music and also how we even define a piece of electronic music in this context. Is the piece the recording? Is it the patch as it existed when it was being recorded? Is it the conceptual core as recorded in our conversation about it? Or if the piece has a discernible melody and rhythm, is, that, is it that collection of note values? Maybe some combination of some or all of these. Here's a question. Have you ever had a song stuck in your head? For the sake of argument, I'm gonna assume that you have, but if you have not, then please share your secret in the comments. Here's another question. When you say you have a song stuck in your head, do you really have the song stuck in your head or is it actually just a scrap of it? Or is it maybe somewhere in between? Several scraps that replay and connect in ways they never did in the original, like you're listening to the song through an auditory kaleidoscope. And if it's a song with lyrics, is it sung in your head by the singer you know from the recording you heard? Or is it your own voice? Or is it maybe somewhere in between, a voice powered under your breath by your own vocal cords in your own imagination, but somehow imbued with the personality of the singer from the recording? If this happens, then who is singing the song? And is it the song? Or is it something new or somewhere in between? New versions and iterations of pieces of music don't just exist in the mind, of course. They're a key part of how music evolves in many traditions. In jazz, for example, it's long been the case that standards are well-trod material from Tin Pan Alley, Broadway, Hollywood, etc., but utilized as a jumping off point rather than an endpoint. And often they make their way so far from the source that it's difficult to even recognize them. Early in my life, I experienced this with the John Coltrane Quartet's rendition of Summertime from the album My Favorite Thing. It's pretty likely that I heard this rendition many times before I ever heard any more traditional takes on the tune. But even after having become familiar with George Gershwin's classic composition, the reharmonization and largely unresolved energy of Coltrane's version was so strikingly different that it probably took me dozens of listens to put two and two together and recognize the source. Coltrane, McCoy, Tyner, and company imbued this operatic lullaby with a tension that totally changed the mood plus entirely change the chord structure to remove most of the cadences and totally change the flavor. For jazz musicians, the relation to standards becomes one of sort of a working knowledge of the chord changes underlying them and an ever-expanding palette of ways to bend these structures out of shape and back in again. But even in less obviously malleable forms, differing versions become part of the story of a piece of music. Is Stravinsky's Rite of Spring a collection of dots on paper? Or is it the shapes that linger in the air when an orchestra plays it? How much of the piece is comprised by its reputation as the piece that caused a riot at its premiere and would be evoked many times as a sort of gateway to musical modernism? By the mid 20th century and beyond, it becomes pretty common to identify studio recordings of musical works as the works themselves. Take Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, for example. A live performance of this album, no matter how faithful to the recording, would probably be considered a rendition or interpretation, not the piece itself. If we had access to a recording of that first performance of Rite of Spring, complete with screams of disapproval and thrown objects pelting the performers, would that recording 
be the piece? Classical music aficionados debate the accuracy of performances by different soloists and conductors. Audiophiles debate the merits of different pressings of their favorite albums, how they sound on different playback systems and different listening environments. In neither case do we end up with consensus on what exactly defines the piece. It's versions all the way down. And the advent of musical recording technology as a tool of creation as well as replication in the 20th century and beyond has led to even more explicit doubling and complicating of the ideas of a piece of music. Versions and dub sides, remixes, sampling, and beyond, giving us new pieces that are both constructed from and add to the identity and story of old ones. Digital distribution of music has fragmented things once again. Songs and albums are edited after release. Different versions appear on different platforms. Well-regarded veterans like Bjork and Brian Eno release albums as or alongside suites of smartphone apps and software. Today, some might even feel nostalgia for the golden age of the record as a distinct commodity, a bounded, packaged, physical object that you could purchase, take home, and own. The historically brief heyday of that market-driven illusion of artworks as complete and defined still looms large over these conversations. We could go on on this topic indefinitely, and perhaps we already have. But let's shift gears and narrow down the focus to the question of how to replicate a specific piece. Electronic music is particularly resistant to universalizable notation. How can you hand over a score and expect it to be played in any repeatable way to a musician whose instrument is different from anybody else's, and beyond that, whose instrument is reconfigured every time they patch it? This may be part of why, in the world of synths, we tend to talk about patches just as much as we talk about pieces or compositions or songs. The patch isn't exactly congruent with the finished product. It's more of a zone of possibilities, a plane of composition. It's neither a starting point nor an end point. It's a continuing point, a ray, a vector, motion the connecting tissue between past and future. While gathering my thoughts for this video, I was doing some home reorganization, and I stumbled on a notebook filled with notes to self and attempts to score my patches. Some of it takes the form of scraps of conceptual underpinnings. In other places, I attempted some sort of visual time domain score that I could follow during a performance. Most of it is simply lists of connections or diagrams of signal flow to be used as shorthand for setting up a known patch when converting it into a live situation, or even for recreating later. I imagine that different people have different approaches to this. We've certainly had some fun luck recreating viewers' patches here on the channel with Zero Coast, Zero Control, and Strega in the Community Patches series. But the more malleable and singular the system being used, the harder it gets to come up with the exact ways to recreate. And even the most thorough list of connections is only a small piece of the puzzle that is further complicated by the many possible combinations of knob settings. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. When I build a patch in a video on this channel, I'm almost always actually rebuilding a patch that I just painstakingly disassembled moments before shooting. I spend hours making these patches to fine tune their sound and streamline them so they show the concepts as clearly as possible. I also get all the knob settings in place for the exact sound that I want so that when I film them, I make a fresh patch connection and the controls are already set exactly the way I want. My video scripts include many notes to myself on what to patch when. Next time, let's recreate one of those shared system patches, but we'll really do it from scratch. No prior knob settings or patching, we'll just listen to the recording, inspect a little bit of 
how it was described in the conversation video, and then see if we can use that information to make it again or make it anew. In the meantime, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments on what determines the identity of a piece of music and how or whether you like to document your own process create scores, collaborate with other musicians, recreate earlier work, etc. One of the beautiful things about the tools and instruments of electronic music is that with the vast number of possibilities, each musician can continually develop their own personal approach. Thanks for watching, and happy patching.